of the Welfare Reform Committee in 2014. Could everyone please make sure that their mobile phones and other electronic devices are switched off? We go to our agenda item one, uh, which is the first item of business, a decision on whether to delegate to the convener responsibility for arranging for the SPCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses for witnesses on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Is that agreed? Thank you. Agenda item two. Uh, the second item of business is a decision on whether to take uh, uh, our agenda item five today, which is consideration of the evidence of the committee uh, that it will receive uh, on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill in private at today's meeting and at all future meetings where that issue is discussed. Is that agreed? Okay, and that's also agreed. And agenda item three is a decision on whether to take consideration of a draft report on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill in private at all future meetings. Is that agreed? Okay. That brings us to agenda item four, which is the committee's first evidence session on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. We hope today to gain an insight into local authorities' views on the bill, and this and the other evidence sessions that the committee has planned will be used to inform our evidence sessions with the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Margaret Burgess, on the 4th of November, and ultimately the committee's stage one report on this bill. So I'd like to welcome Susan Donald, who's benefit manager of Aberdeenshire Council, uh, Dave Berry, who's the head of services, finance, contracts and welfare rights at Dundee City Council, uh, our only elected representative on the panel this morning from the local authority, that's uh, Councillor Norman MacDonald, who's the convener of Western Isles Council, Alistair MacArthur, Finance and Operations Manager of Renfrewshire Council, Helen McGreevy, Scottish Welfare Fund Coordinator, South Lanarkshire Council, and Nicola Reid, Team Leader of Benefits Operations and Scottish Welfare Fund at West Lothian Council. As this is a round table discussion, I hope that it can be a, a free and open dialogue. Um, I might come to certain people to, um, to ask questions or, or to, to keep the thing moving forward. But please feel free, if you have a contribution to make, just indicate to me that you want to come in. If you want to ask a question yourselves, if you just want to make a comment on any, anything that someone else has said, the, the freer and open the discussion, the more information we get and the better informed we'll be as we, we look at the bill. But to kick the, the ball off, I'm going to show my uh, parochial uh, bias and go to Helen McGreevy from South Lanarkshire Council, since I represent that area. And, uh, Helen, your experience of the Scottish Welfare Fund and looking at the bill, how things are going to move forward, could you give us some opening comment just to, to start the ball rolling? Right. Um, since it's uh, moved over to local authorities, I found that working with the variety of different organisations has been really helpful, both to the customers and ourselves for building up relationships. Um, also using... Um, our authority to use a furnishing service and we provide goods. It's delivered to the, the claimants and things like that as well, which is extremely helpful. Um, I think the only concern that we have as an authority that we don't have maybe a, as much funding at the moment to be able to investigate any fraudulent claims, things like that. We'd like visiting officers. We do that at the moment. But in the main, uh, we're managing our budget very well. Our processing times are, I think, really quite good at the moment. It's, for the last three months, it's about 93% for community care grants, 98% for crisis grants. Uh, one of the areas where um, our systems maybe fail us a wee bit is uh, when we receive applications, uh, they're recorded on our system. But um, if, for example, they're from prisoners, they apply two months beforehand, before they're released. So that knocks for time scales out. Mm -hmm. Same with crisis grants. It could be uh, we require some evidence, so we can't make a decision within the two days. So that skews for crisis grants as well. Crisis grants, we tend to try and process within 24 hours. Uh, and it's only uh, cases where we're looking for evidence is longer than that. We're aware very much about the vulnerability of the people that we're dealing with, and we try and process them as quickly as possible. I don't know, is there anything else? I was sort of caught in hop this morning. <laughs> Does that sort of give you a wee sort of background? We'll, we'll yeah. try and get some information from elsewhere. 
Can we go to yourself, Councillor uh, McDonald? You see it from a different perspective, but you, you want to give us your, your views on, on how things have been and, and looking yeah. forward to the bill, anything that you think we need to be particularly paying attention to? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I'm very much, even although it is from a different perspective, from an elected member's perspective, very much uh, the same has been said by Helen there. Uh, we have far better and far more effective relationships at the local level than they were there before in terms of engagement with, with third sector and also other partner agencies in terms of housing associations. Uh, and I think that has a significant benefit to, to, the, to the clients and the people who are, who are affected by, um, by welfare reform. And I think that's something that the Scottish Welfare Fund has significantly contributed to, is the building of these partnerships and being far more effective in, in, and proactive in, in recognising what the issues are for local people. Certainly within our local authorities, a small local authority, some of the issues are the same, but there is a big difference in scale. And one of the things that has the biggest impact for us is fuel poverty in, term, in terms of people's ability to, to heat their homes. And there's a whole range of things that, that affect that, that are particular to, to our authority. And these are, the things that, um, these are the things that we still will face challenges on um, as, as the bill goes through. Uh, and, and beyond that, and, and we would certainly be looking for things in there that will mitigate the impact of that, because as things stand, supposing we were to <coughs> insulate every property in the Western Isles, there will still be an issue in relation to fuel poverty, purely because of the cost of fuel and, and the climate. That will have an impact on people. So there are things like that uh, that have an impact. I also think that responsiveness is much better in terms of the targets that are set for dealing with both the, 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 um, the crisis care and, and um, the crisis grant and the, and the community care. And again, we tend to put out five times more in terms of goods to people rather than giving giving cash out to them through crisis care. And, and I think, again, that is something that is a material thing. And you know what the money is being spent on. You know that the goods that go into people's homes are going to be there for the benefit of, the, of everybody within that setting, rather than giving out the money and then wondering whether it's actually being spent on, on, um, on what it's intended to be. But certainly, certainly uh, a good, positive move uh, for us as an authority, and I know that will be reflected possibly with other local authorities, but, but there will be local nuances as well that have to be taken into account. Yeah. So, yeah, talking about those local nuances, you're a, a rural uh, authority, South Lanarkshire's mixed rural and, and urban Dundee. Uh, is there anything sp specific, Mr Berry, you want to bring to your attention from a, a city council's? Point of view? Yeah, um, certainly within Dundee, um, there, there are high levels of, of deprivation, um, and we've found um, the opportunity to work uh, more closely with, um, with, with individuals that have applied through the Scottish Welfare Fund um, and actually start to build on uh, the work that we already do with a great majority of them, because a lot of these applicants are already known to social work um, and housing um, services. And the, the kind of ability to, to work in that more holistic uh, manner with, um, with these individuals and really to try and start to get to the root of the problem to st stop and um, repeat applications and, and really to kind of try to, to support these individuals as best uh, we can. Um, we've also found that with the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, again, um, following a similar theme to, to other local authorities, we're kind of providing less and less cash and it's more goods and a lot of the goods that we are um, sourcing um, are, are providing are sourced locally. So we're, we're able to support local businesses and um, we're, we're supporting a, a supported employment workshop um, through the provision of furniture. Uh, we have a, a social enterprise um, in terms of carpet fitting and through um, a, a locally based electrical um, distribu distributor we're able to create employment opportunities. So we found it to be very positive. Good. Not that I'm looking for conflict, I'm looking for problems, but if there are problems, we need to address them. Uh, I'm, my understanding, Mr MacArthur, is that you're not entirely happy about the role or the potential role of SPSO. Is it, do, you, do you want to give us a flavour of, of your thinking around that? Um, yeah, I th certainly in terms of our response to the committee's consultation um, and in indeed in the draft bill, we had made comment that we didn't feel the 
the, the nature of a review process in terms of the, the, the dual powers that would be given to the SPO CSO in terms of not only, not only reviewing a decision but having the ability to then direct a council to, to change its decision. We didn't feel that sat particularly well with the, the existing ethos of the SPSO in terms of um, you know, managing and ensuring good customer service and, and dealing with complaints. Um, we also had concerns with the potential volume of secondary reviews that is, is apparent were are being generated. And I appreciate it's still early days in terms of the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, but when you look at the number of secondary reviews that have been in, incurred even in the first quarter of this financial year on a national basis, I think projecting that forward, um, and gra granted it is still early days, I think that the overall number will be at the, the lower range um, of the, the numbers that have been suggested by the SPSO and, and some of the, the financial memoranda to the, to the, to the bill. Um, so we, again, had a question about the, the value for money um, about having a separate organisation when the existing arrangements for managing secondary reviews as we've experienced over the past 18 months or so appear to have worked very well when they've been managed within each local authority area. Okay, Kevin, you indicated you want to ask a question then, Linda. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested to hear um, about uh, whether or not co cooperation is taking place between those that are administering um, the crisis grants and the community care grants as part of the social welfare fund um, compared to uh, those who may be uh, doling out monies uh, by other means through um, social work emergency grants, um, etc. Is there a level of cooperation between the teams uh, that are dealing with the social welfare fund and others? Um, are, is there a situation in some cases where uh, these have been integrated uh, into one team? I'd be really interested to convene her in hearing what's happening around about that. Yes, there, there's certainly a very close cooperation between colleagues across, across social services. The emergency payments, for example, haven't been integrated with the Scottish Welfare Fund because there's a, net, there's a strong element there of um, care management involvement in that actual decision. Um, but an example of where we work quite closely is where care management are uh, perhaps um, implementing a new housing scheme for uh, learning disability adults. Um, they'll work with the Scottish Welfare Fund to provide the community care grants um, for some of the furnishing items with that scheme. It's actually a, an integrated scheme between social work and a revenues department in recognition that the, the hard, there are different skills um, that the rev, revenues are, are, um, are really skilled in the processing side of things um, and social work bring a different dimension to that. Um, and in, in terms of the, um, the, the actual scheme itself, we employ two welfare rights officers that are based in social work um, who will assist decision makers um, and also liaise with um, various uh, social workers and housing support officers, for instance, um, to assist with the decision-making process. Councillor, I think you come here. In response to uh, Mr. Stewart's question, I think there is a great deal more cooperation, uh, and I hesitate to use the word in an informal uh, sense because it is informal because there isn't a formal structure uh, of integration. But I think uh, it's certainly something we've started discussing in the context of health and social care integration and, and what happens to what, what, is, what remains uh, within the local authority of the traditional social work, social work department. That, and, and I think there will undoubtedly be more formal integration across across the um, uh, welfare reform and, and, uh, and what used to be the social, social work de department. It already happens in an informal way, and it's probably more so because we're a small local authority um, and quite compact in that sense. But, but I think that's probably something that other local authorities will be looking at as well as health and social care integration in general moves forward. Ashwit. Very difficult to administer the Scottish Welfare Fund without the support of our social work teams. 
They have an in-depth knowledge of some of the applicants that are um, presenting to Scottish Welfare Fund. Therefore, we can get some valuable advice on assistance that is required. So, um, I think across councils you'll find that there is a very close working relationship between Scottish Welfare Fund teams and social work departments. Is that what we experience, Helen? We have the exact same uh, liaise quite a lot with the, with the Welfare Rights Service within the authority. Um, we put in all our standard letters if they're unhappy with a decision. We've given them phone numbers to contact. We have a good working relationship with the Welfare Rights Service as well and with social work. Again, for cases where um, there's mental health issues and we're looking for a wee bit more information, they're really very supportive and it helps our decision makers uh, come to the correct decision for the applicant. Okay, Mr McArthur, just to give you an opportunity to comment on that point. Um, no, I, I, I would just echo um, what my colleagues have said. Um, there is very close working between um, my service, which actually administers the, the Welfare Fund, and a more, I suppose from a more transactional perspective, um, but there is very close working with, with our colleagues in social work um, and, and in housing as well. Um, I suppose we have, a, similar to other authorities, employed um, some, some kind of advice works a, services, which provide money advice services, so that um, as part of our social work service. And also in terms of energy advisory services, we have um, a courtesy of the Welfare Resilience Fund that we were uh, successful in securing some, some awards from. We have employed two energy advisory officers, again, to provide a more holistic service for those who can, uh, who find themselves in a situation where they're required to apply to, to the Welfare Fund for, for support. Linda, you wanted to come in with that? Yeah, I've got a, a quick follow-on question, if that's okay, convener, before I, I go on to what I was wanting to ask yes, about. Sir. It was something that Helen said earlier, which probably relates to working with uh, not just within council departments, but with other agencies. Helen, you had said that um, sometimes crisis grants were held up because of evidence mm -hmm. um, gathering required. And I, want, I just wondered if... Um, you were having issues with particular other agencies in that, in gathering evidence, or if it was all internal, something that could be said. It, it tends to be that we're looking for what the class is pink slips from the police. You know, it, it tends to be lost wallets, um, lost purses, and it's maybe where the claimants have had several lost wallets <laughs> and purses. Uh, and we look, we, you know, we don't, we, we try and get evidence, you know, and that's the only way that we can get it in that situation. Right. Other areas, I think that's the only area where, where there's delays, but we give the applicant, as soon as they make the application, two days from that date to provide us with the evidence to enable us to process it. Right, okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. The main thing I wanted to ask about was uh, Alistair saying that uh, Renfrewshire went totally. Uh, pleased with the SPSO for second tier reviews. I would be interested to know how local authorities deal with their first tier reviews you know, and the, the variations amongst them. Because also uh, going back to some third sector organisations, I'm quoting Spice here, um, were concerned about gatekeepers uh, refusing applications for full consideration was given to the case. So if we could link these two things about who makes that initial decision and then on to who does the first tier review. Um, yes, um, the, the first tier review is done by someone other than the officer that actually made the decision. Um, it's usually done by the team leader, partly at the moment because the volumes have been so low in terms of first-year review requests, certainly in Aberdeenshire, um, that that's actually been a workload that's manageable. Um, following on from that, if, the, um, if a second-year review is required, we have a panel that comprises um, housing, um, a head of housing and a housing manager um, with social work involvement, um, the revenues manager and the um, head of finance who will then relook at that decision and I'll be there to advise that particular panel um, based on any new information that's come to light. Um, and I, certainly from the very few reviews that we've had, 
Um, some ha we've upheld the original decision. Um, others, we have overturned it, and sometimes we've actually met in the middle uh, when it comes to those decisions. Can I ask what it is that kicks in that review? It's a request from the, um, from the applicant. Um, the, the letter that goes out to the applicant will explain um, what's been awarded, um, why that award has been made, what's been refused and why, and then it gives them the option to request a first-year review. Um, and then, after that's taken place, they're advised of what they can do next to instigate a second-tier review. Just to follow up on the, on the, the issue of gatekeeping, um, just obviously I speak about my own authority, but um, there's, there's not anything like a, a kind of gatekeeping um, kind of process in place. Once the applications come in um, to the local authority, they are through the system, the, the kind of Northgate system that we use, they're allocated out to a decision maker. So the decision maker will get that case there and then. Um, and then it would be the same process as Susan's laid out in terms of any, any um, reviews requested. OK. Michael. Review when our applicants phone to make an application. Our um, customer service centre takes the application regardless of whether they think that person would qualify for a grant or not. The reason for that is that the holistic approach that local authorities um, put on this scheme is that they might not qualify for a grant, but we can um, help them access other services should they require further assistance if we can't help them. As far as the first year review is concerned, it is, again, as Susan said, it's dealt with by someone completely independent to the person that made the first um, decision and that's usually the line manager of the, the team. As far as the second tier review is, pro, uh, is, is concerned, it's done with people completely outside the service, so completely independent to the service altogether. However, our second tier review are so low that keeping that knowledge um, for someone to be able to carry out a second tier review is very difficult. So we did, on the original consultation back in February, we did say that we were in favour of the SPSO. However, on that questionnaire, there was a, a, an option should SPSOs have the ability to overturn a discretionary, discretionary element of the decision. And we said no to that, but they could make decisions on points of, of law. Um, that doesn't seem to have been reflected going forward. It would appear that they are now can make or overturn decisions. On, on any part of the decision-making process, which puts in question, depending on the numbers, our local authority budget is going to be under pressure if there are a number of second-tier reviews overturned, particularly on the discretionary element of the part of the scheme. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I'd be interested in self convener <laughs> <laughs> I just happen to have my stats with me. <laughs> um, for first-tier uh, appeals, again, when people are applying for uh, grants, a lot of them can apply through their online. They're not speaking to a person on the phone, uh, and they don't put a great deal of information sometimes in the form. And I've just looked at our first-tier appeals. 14 were applied in May, and 11 were overturned uh, in the applicant's favour. Now, that's way us getting further evidence talking to the applicant as well. Um, a lot of them put very little information on their application as well, or they provide information after a decision has been made. So our uh, overturn rate you know, that we receive from other organisations, like our welfare rights service, our citizens' advice, obviously supports the applicant as well, and it gives us more information to make a, to overturn the original decision. Ken. Uh, there's a couple of questions if I could. Uh, also pick up on your opening, that's the trouble with opening the remarks. <laughs> uh, really. um, you suggested that uh, most of the crisis grants were turned around within one day, although the deadline is two days. Could I just ask the other local authorities, the old crisis grant system run by the DWP had a one day turnaround time and it is a crisis grant. Um, would you all be able to turn it around in one day? Uh, why did the Scottish Government, do you think, give you a two day um, deadline rather than a one day deadline? 
Okay. First of all, when it was a DWP system, it wasn't um, a grant, it was a loan. So they didn't need to meet any criteria, uh, I don't think. And uh, it was just taken and it was processed. Uh, for crisis grants, we need to make sure that they, they meet the conditions. Uh, and again, you know, if it's constant lost purses and that, we need to look at, because we do have a budget and we need to take care of that budget. And that, that again, is we're looking at the budget and making sure that the monies are going to the, the most vulnerable people, whereas the DWP took an application, paid it out, and that was it. The, the customer, again, the, they had, it was deductions off the benefit, whereas they don't get anything, they get a grant, and that's how we get repeat applications, I think, a lot as well. I can agree with, with Helen there, but um, in addition, um, one of the, the kind of holistic approach that has been, has been described, that extra time gives you a little bit extra um, to, to investigate further um, and you know, potentially get to, to you know, identify the root of the particular problem. So again, um, t extra time taken to check with social workers, to check with uh, housing support officers um, around the, the particular circumstances in which the, the applicant is applying. So that extra, you know, extra time um, does help to, to, to provide that. I think, I mean, again, I think the intention is that, you know, given it is a crisis grant, that that grant is awarded as soon as is practically possible in terms of the tests that are there. Uh, but, but there is a more holistic service um, being, being delivered, and it does involve speaking to other agencies, some of which aren't within the council. Uh, and I think, ultimately, that might flag up something for them as something that they have to do, whether it's, whether it's to do with somebody who's a tenant in a housing association property or, or whatever. I, th I, think, I think it's certainly, the intention is to get, to get the grant award as soon as possible. But I think given, given the onus that it is for, for joint working and de dealing with the issues in a collaborative way, I think it's inevitable that it can go into the second day. Um, but, but I don't think that's a, necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Second question, well, there's three questions behind this. The second question is actually picking up on Councillor McDonald's uh, point earlier uh, about giving uh, awards in kind rather than cash. Now, just leaving to aside the community care grant, but actually focusing on the crisis grant itself, I was wondering if others agreed. The voluntary sector, in giving evidence uh, on the interim welfare scheme, suggested quite strongly that uh, if you want to build the resilience of individuals, then you're actually far better giving them cash to allow them to make their own choices, and that by focusing on giving, uh, one, of the, one of the weaknesses, for example, about focusing on giving uh, grants, uh, give, giving support in kind, is that there's actually an element of distrust there, that you're actually focusing on, perhaps on fraud rather than resilience. Do you have any views, because there's a mixture of uh, practice across the local authorities. Yeah. Any other authorities have views on that? Um. One of the areas we look at, it was more so for community care grants because we use a furnishing service. We get more value for the more money and we can help more people. And that, that was the biggest area. Uh, also, the furnishing service employ a lot of staff, work experience, and that helps the community as well. Um, with regards to, I can see where the third parties are coming from about people having to make their own decisions, but not everybody sometimes has the support there to help them. We, we refer a lot of people because a lot of the times people are applying for crisis grants as they're finding it really difficult managing the, the money they get. They get a little amount to manage over a fortnightly basis. So we have budgeting teams uh, and we might help them out at that point, but we need to look at the problem to try and resolve the problem for them to enable them to be able to manage their budget, or if they've got debt problems, we refer them to debt counsellors as well. It's, it's providing that extra bit of support to the applicants, and I think that's the route we should begin down. Thank you. Uh, in relation to crisis grants, which I think was your, your question, what we um, have found, and which I'm quite sure a lot of local authority, uh, other local authorities have found, is that um, you have to make sure that the money that we give them is being used for the purpose that it was intended for, and whether that be food or fuel or you know whatever. Um, to give them cash, um, I think it's it's 
it's right to say that it's not often used for that purpose. So there, if local authorities are going down the route of supermarket vouchers or fuel cards, then we know that the money that we're spending is actually going to what is actually needed for that family and not, as we have historically found, that if we give them you know, £30 for food over the weekend, that it's maybe been spent on alcohol or, or, or drugs or you know, you know, whatever, if they have an addiction. That is what we found, um, and we are trying to move away from a cash option for crisis grants and moving more to um, supermarkets providing food, etc., so that the money is, uh, is hitting home and it's been used for what, what it's intended for. Can I, can I just check this? Sorry, Kavina. Is there any, is there any, have there been any studies or any research done or any evidence to support the idea that people are misspending cash? Or is it anecdotal? I, mean, I, I certainly recognise what you're saying. I'm just wondering if it's anecdotal or whether it's evidence-based. I think um, the evidence is in the repeat applicants. Um, we find that we give cash in faith that it's going to be spent on X, you know, whatever it's been uh, asked for. Um, and then the same applicants come back on a repeated basis asking for money for the same item. Mm. Um, and the, the, the client group that we work with can sometimes be very honest and they do tell us that they have not spent that money on its intended purpose. So there might not be any official information on that, but from an operational point of view, we can see that that is very much um, how, you know, how things are. Okay, uh, Susan and then Dave. Um, in a, Aberdeenshire being a rural authority, uh, we have particular challenges when it comes to providing goods for crisis grants, which is why in our case, what we provide is cash or energy vouchers. Um, there's no one predominant um, supermarket or, or outlet that we can actually enter into a voucher scheme given the distances that people would potentially have to travel. Um, as Nicola said, the, the, the clients that are going to misuse it are the ones that will be repeat applicants for crisis grants. But we've equally had a couple of instances where having provided goods, those goods have been sold um, in order to get the cash um, rather than, you know, used. And that's after they've been, um, you know, packaging and everything removed. Um, it's, it's very difficult to um, prevent um, people misusing a system that does rely quite heavily on trust and assessing that need when they first apply. And just in terms of, again, it's, it is anecdotal, um, it's not kind of formal research that's been, been done, but we, when we started the Scottish Welfare Fund, we were given cash because we didn't have the fulfilment options uh, in place. Um, when we started to, in a similar way to Renfrewshire, sure, introduce energy advice officers, so rather than somebody getting £50 pounds of energy, an energy advice officer would be sent out to the house to, to kind of liaise with the, the, the energy company. Um, review the tariff and negotiate um, kind of lower tariffs. Um, we found that there was a, quite a significant drop in the number of people who would then accept the award. So it kind of indicated that the, 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 what they were going to use that, that money for wasn't the, the kind of energy costs that they, they stated that they needed. And in a similar, a similar vein, um, uh, with regards to travel costs, we started to introduce um, that we would buy the travel ticket, whether it was a bus ticket or a train ticket, and again, um, a number of um, applicants then declined the offer of that particular award. I think we, we actually have statistics as well about the amount of vouchers that we pay out and that aren't redeemed, which amazed me when I started with the, the project. Uh, both uh, tends to be energy vouchers that you know we award it, go through all the process, explain it to them, and they don't cash it. What's that? No, it's paid back into the fund. I, do, I review that on a monthly basis, and the, the voucher expires after a month, right. and we pay it back into the system, but quite a large amount. Okay, can you? Question? Final question, uh, Kimia. Thank you. Is um, Again, the voluntary sector have raised concerns about uh, one of the um, powers of the bill which allows local authorities to outsource 
um, this whole process to other bodies, including uh, to privatise it. Uh, what do local authorities think about this, about this concern, about this power? And do any plan to outsource it, or do you already outsource it? Um, so just to get a final question there, no, Brentfordshire has no plans to, to outsource um, a, a, a current operation. Um, we, we were content with having that flexibility within the bill um, that allows local authorities to outsource. And it wasn't so much in terms of bringing the private sector on board, but looking across um, local authority boundaries, that, that's where we were coming from, and potentially engaging a bit more with the very organisations that, that you've mentioned in terms of getting them more and providing assistance in terms of administering the fund as well. So we thought there were potentially opportunities there. That our only kind of concern was that in doing that, some of the, the what we've what has been talked about this morning in terms of the local knowledge about what local support services are available. If you were outsourcing potentially across local authority boundaries, then that local knowledge may be diluted slightly. So that was that was a one concern. But in terms of having that flexibility within the bill, um, and in terms of you know the, the the cash limited amount that local authorities have, both in terms of the overall fund size and in terms of the administration resource that we have, then having that flexibility is, is useful. Okay. Uh, Alex. Just on that <coughs> subject, certainly my reading of the bill, that's the reason why that outsourcing uh, clause is uh, included. However, there are a number of uh, key local authority areas uh, responsibility that are outsourced to the third sector, for example. Uh, is this an area that would lend itself to that approach, do you think? I, I, I think there's, there's the potential there to do that, but it's not something that we've explored to any great mm. extent. Um, I, I, th I think <coughs> one of the first things that, as a local authority, we, we, we would need to be content with is that a, the third sector has the, the capacity and, and the ability to, to help us in, in that area, and that's something that we've, we've not explored as yet. Just on that point, uh, I don't think there's any, uh, any doubt that local authorities are engaging with the third sector in particular uh, and working in partnership with them, uh, including, including um, citizens and vice women said. And, and maybe elements of the work that's required to be done can be outsourced, but I think that's something that will come through time, through having worked through the process and seeing what works best for, for, for the client and what makes it more certain that the, that the resource is going to where it needs to go. Uh, but certainly we don't, we don't have a, as a policy aim to outsource, but I think it is important within a local context that we have engaged in the process agencies who have a far longer reach into communities than, than, than we have as a local authority even, and, and that involves very much the third sector. Yeah, uh, yeah just, just on, a, on, on a kind of practical level, um, one of the, the benefits of local authority um, providing, particularly when it's providing goods um, and services, is its uh, VAT status. And in terms of affordability, um, the local authority can claim back VAT. So in terms of the, the pot, the, the, the fund itself, it can potentially go further than if it was, if it was um, being delivered by, by an external uh, agency. Okay, Annabelle, you want to ask a question? Hey, thank you, uh, good morning. Um, yeah, just continuing on that subject, and perhaps um, looking at the subject not so much from formal outsourcing uh, and all that that would entail, but just at the moment, to what extent are local authorities engaged with the third sector, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis to try to deliver for the, the applicants? Because obviously there seems to be a lot of capacity out there and it would be a shame in terms of also value for the public purse if that capacity was not being called upon. I just wonder what the current state of play is. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of main link with the, with the third sector is around the local advice services, um, so the citizens' advice in, uh, in particular. Um, and again, kind of working with them around whether it be signposting um, applicants on to them um, or uh, actually just kind of following up uh, with them on some of, some of, some of the issues um, that, are, uh, that, that the individuals are actually facing. Um, so we, we have quite a good network within Dundee um, and we are awaited to work further with, um, with the uh, advice sector 
um, around the issue of sanctions um, from the DWP and really focusing on them as a, as a priority. Um, so when people present themselves to um, the Scottish Welfare Fund because they've been sanctioned is the, is the next step from, from us and how we can use the, the wider capacity in the voluntary sector to assist individuals um, that, are, that have been sanctioned. Our colleagues, Alistair. Yeah, I, th I think there is a reasonable level of engagement between authorities and the third sector already, um, but I, th I think there's always work that, that can be done there and that can be improved further. Um, I, th I think it's helpful in some cases where a claimant is already, has already engaged with a, a, a charitable organisation. For example, we had a, a case where um, we had a member of an ex-soldier uh, who was already engaged with the Help for Heroes uh, charity. Um, and we were able to engage with them and get a much clearer picture about that individual's circumstances and their family circumstances, which uh, helped us arrive at what, what, was, what we think was a better outcome for that individual in terms of the decision that we were able to make. So I, I think it's helpful in those cases where the third sector is already potentially involved with, with claimants that we can link into that, because as Councillor MacDonald says, they, some of these organisations have a much deeper reach into the community than, than the Council has. So it's helpful in that context. Yeah, well, in that regard, I mean, what it, it seems to me from the few comments made thus far that there's a recognition that there probably is more scope. Um, so what would the local authorities plan to do to determine what further scope there is and how to bring that on board? What would be the next steps in that regard? If I, if I could, uh, to refers back to what I said about health and social care integration. That is going to drive that agenda forward to a large extent for us. And, and, and we've already indicated to the third sector within, within the Hebrides that, uh, that, that there is a challenge for them to be, to be able to step up to the, to the plate, as it were, to deliver these services, because we believe that, that working together with them is going to is going to provide a far better service to clients across the board, not just in terms of uh, the social welfare uh, reform agenda, but across the board, there will, be, there will be a far better service provided across the community as a whole through that, through that, um, through the mechanisms, whether that be through service level agreements uh, that are re that are reviewed from time to time, or through more form other formal processes as well. But the intention is that it that it will become more formal without damaging the independence of the third sector because that would be counterproductive. It would ju just be, people would see this just another arm of the local authority, which may not be the most uh, um, advantageous position to be in. But I certainly think that that's something that's gonna, gonna, um, going to increase across the piece uh, over, over the next two or three years. Okay, Wanda. Just, just on that question, I, I just wondered if there's a general view um, as Councillor MacDonald said, that that would increase, in fact, over the next few years. And I am aware there's places, um, for example, advice services within some councils um, and also Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, and I just wondered if there's any view as to how that might change in the future in terms of outsourcing advice services only to CAN. Anyone like to comment on that? And you're up again, Councillor. I just, sorry, I, I just, I don't think it has to be either or. I mean, we've already outsourced. Uh, we already have a service level agreement with Citizens Advice Bureau, um, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't have uh, fairly senior people uh, within within the finance department, Good, yeah. the head of service within within uh -huh. the finance department that deals with the community community services section. Uh, she liaises on a daily basis with Citizens Advice uh, Bureau, so it's, it's not as if we're pam. Uh, right. Pan things off to the third sector. It is a real engagement. They are they're right. welcome the fact that they have this arrangement with the local authority. And I think the most important thing is that they see that that is a far greater benefit to, to their clients who uh -huh. are our residents, you know, uh, yeah. and, and, and they're the ones who are evidencing the benefit from doing that. But it doesn't have to be either or. I think it's important that the local authority still has a degree of control over... Uh -huh over any of these services that are outsourced, either informally or formally, because ultimately we, we will be held to account for the delivery of these services to some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Good, thanks. Okay. 
Um, in previous discussions around the, the, the implementation of the early days of the, this, the new Scottish Welfare Fund, there was some anecdotal evidence that one of the reasons for the, the, the poor take-up was the lack of information, the lack of knowledge about people where to go. And one of the issues that, that arose uh, in evidence uh, to us was that there was still a tendency for people to believe that the DWP was the, the place to go to, to secure this type of support. And although the DWP believed that they had in place uh, systems which would signpost people to where the, the, the help would actually be, uh, there was enough evidence from witnesses to suggest that that, that wasn't actually taking place. Um, it appears to have improved. The take-up of, of the, the Scottish Welfare Fund has improved, but from your experience, is, is there still a lack of knowledge out there about where people should go? Is the DWP signposting people in the way that they believe that they should? Um, do you have any evidence that there are still communication problems, if you like? Um, yeah, Alistair? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't say in terms of evidence, in terms of the, the, the signposting that the DWP do, but one of the things that, because we, we recognised within Renfrewshire um, early on in the, in the days of the Welfare Fund that um, the level of knowledge out in the community and particularly amongst some of our stakeholder groups was not at a level that it should be. So as part of the Council's economic development policy, we, we employed three interns um, and that was their role, essentially, to go out and act as advocates for the welfare fund uh, across a range of stakeholder groups, whether that's the prison service, uh, some of the, the local charities, the local housing associations, health services, and so on, um, going out even into GP surgeries and so on, to make sure that um, anybody who could possibly be linked with anyone who might be in a situation where they, they would find themselves um, make, uh, needing to make a, a claim from the welfare fund that that information was available. Um, so that, that has been reasonably successful in Renfrewshire in terms of heightening the profile of the welfare fund, and I'm sure that other authorities will have been doing similar work. Um, I suppose our challenge now is to sustain that, that level of knowledge in the community, because as, as, as there is, you know, certainly among some of our stakeholders, there is you know, a reasonable amount of staff turnover and so on, and some of that knowledge can dissipate um, relatively quickly. So. That's one of the challenges for us that we find over the course of this current year is, is maintaining that level of knowledge um, out in the community. Um, but certainly it seems to have, a, in terms of the number of applications that we're getting, um, it, it appears to have worked, worked well. Is, is that the case elsewhere? Or, or soon? Uh, yes, we've, we've done quite a lot of work to raise the profile of it. Um, but we've also done a bit of work with... Um, um, the third sector and social work to actually change perceptions because I think there was a for quite a while there was a feeling that there was no point applying for it because they were judging it prejudging it on the basis of how the DWP had administered the social fund um, now that they've they've got used to working with us we're certainly seeing a significant uptake in applications um, we've gone up by 24% um, on the first you know, compared to the same first five months of, of last year. So we're seeing that um, the increase in the applications, the increase in the quality of the information that we're getting, and quite a lot of work ahead of time, whether it's a new housing scheme or whether it's with the homelessness strategy, that kind of thing, to see where the fund fits into that. Yeah, Dave? Um, yeah, just a, a, a general, um, from the Church, which is wants to um, the implications of welfare reform um, has has been to to kind of form a partnership um, arrangement with um, our local DWP um, officers, and we've worked quite closely uh, in, in identifying um, some of, some of the issues around welfare reform uh, and trying to, to work together to mitigate that. And there are a number of projects that the council has been, and the partnership has been successful in obtaining funding for, which help um, to get. The message not just around Scottish Welfare Fund but around what other assistance is available um, in response to, to welfare reform uh, through, for instance, the use of volunteers in, in the library service, um, a kind of very particular community based um, projects um, where, where there are staff based in the community that will, that will assist, and the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, you know, the kind of whole profile of the Scottish Welfare Fund is, is part of that. 
part of that process. So there, I mean, there's, it's not perfect. There, there are still those that I'm sure are still not aware, but we're, we're getting better around that. Okay. Another question then is, Okay, I'll take you, Annabelle, before I, I, I ask my question. If you like to. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Convener. I was going to ask um, what the general feeling was as to the uh, necessity and or desirability of proceeding by way of legislation. I think one response to the Scottish Government's consultation out of the 48 or so suggested that they felt it was not appropriate to proceed with a bill. I just wondered what the general feeling was amongst the people we have here today. Yeah, I have to say, I, I, I noticed, noted that one specific response, but I've actually been contacted by two or three organisations beyond that to say that they are not sure that, that putting this into legislation is the best way to go forward. They, you know, they wanted to have maximum flexibility and thought that legislation would be too restrictive. Have you had any discussions around, around that? So that, I mean, what, what, the, um, what the legislation would do would, would then um, give um, the local authority that assurance that um, well, it is now a duty um, is something that they, they will have to take forward. And I think that can only be good to, to actually continue with the development of the Scottish Welfare Fund. The interim scheme, um, which, is, which has worked well, um, was only two, two years. Um, and one of the issues that, that we've had is um, because we haven't been able to employ staff on a permanent contract because it's a two-year basis, um, is that you start to get turnover um, in staff. So again, I think as Alistair mentioned, just in terms of that expertise and that knowledge, and you, you start to kind of be in constant training and recruiting um, of, of new staff to have that certainty that um, the Scottish Welfare Fund is here and it's here to stay would, would help with that greatly. I think that's an important response. It's certainly not um, something I had picked up on. As I said, I, I have been approached by people saying they were a bit concerned about the, the legislation being too restrictive, but that's a, a good counterpoint. I, I take that on board. Alistair, you wanted to? Sorry, I'll come to you in a minute, Councillor, but Sorry. Alistair wanted to. Sorry. Um, you, just, just to echo that point, and I think it was picked up um, in a recent Audit Scotland report um, in terms of looking at benefits performance in 1314 was one of the national reports that they had done, but they were... Um, highlighting that the, the difficulty that councils and many councils are having in securing and, and retaining um, benefits qualified staff or people who are experienced in terms of making the types of decisions that we need to make in terms of administering the welfare fund. So it, it, it is an excellent point that, that Dave makes in terms of having the, the, the statutory backing for the welfare fund and having that moving forward. It would do a lot in terms of the security of our existing staff. Okay. Yes, As I said, I mean, it's not something that we've uh, discussed in any significant way within the context of welfare reform, but I do think it gives certainty, not just to local authorities, but it gives certainty to, to, the, to the clients as well, that, you know, you know ab about what's in place. Um, and I think that, uh, there's one thing, the, the one thing uh, that we've noticed is that the admin grant doesn't actually cover the staff time it currently takes, you know, to... to uh, to work through the applications and to build the relationships with the, with, uh, with the other groups within, um, within the islands. And, and I think that's something that you can sustain for a couple of years, uh, but it's not something that's sustainable long term. And, and again, um, th that's some, a provision that would have to be made either by the local authority or through, through the funding on a long term basis. And, and I think the legislation would give confidence that that would be the case. You know, so I, I just can't see any reason why, if the legislation is flexible enough and allows flexibility, why you wouldn't want to be giving people certainty about something that is, is clearly very important. Okay. Another question that I, I had was, you've all had a look at the bill. Is there anything that you think is missing? Is there anything that you're concerned about in terms of its content? Or is there something you would like to comment on the bill specifically um, in order to get us to focus on it uh, as we, we scrutinise the, the bill as it moves forward? Are you all fairly content with it? 
Well, if that's the answer, that's fine. But I was, I was just going to say, one of the things that was mentioned previously, one thing uh, that we would want to see is, is the possibility of having some kind of loan, um, a loan scheme for those who don't meet the criteria for the community uh, care grant or the DWP uh, budgeting loan because um, they're either single, ad single adults or they don't, have, they don't have exceptional pressure. And having a loan fund as a backstop would be something that would help uh, would help a number of people. It's not a huge number of people, but again, they're more likely to be some of the people who are who are quite vulnerable and very much on their own. And whether whether some kind of loan can be can be introduced to the system as well. Uh, as we've heard previously, the bill doesn't specifically exclude it. it doesn't exclude it. But I wonder if we need to pursue that a bit further. Is that certainly something the committee could discuss with the the bill team? Um, just one point, just in response to that, something that we're exploring in Renfrewshire is a having discussion with local credit unions in terms of exactly that so that we can set up uh, loans for small small goods, essentially white goods and so on. So that is, is one way that we're exploring it within Renfrewshire. Um, it's just, just a, yeah, I think this is an area we need to start exploring about as a committee, yeah. Annabelle. Yeah. Um, to what extent there may be information available that would help the committee in looking at that issue? Because if you say there's a demand, well, what's the level of the demand? as a proportion of the, the total, what kind of numbers are we talking about? It would be perhaps useful to have an idea of that in order to be able to look at that issue in more detail as a committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is that we are still seeing some people that are falling between the stools, as it were, and that could be helped. We're not talking about huge numbers, but there are people who, who, who are as worthy of support as, as others. So yeah, I would like to explore the credit union aspect of that convener because I know that there's a lot of discussions um, going on amongst credit unions and the appropriate minister, uh, Mr Ewing, at the moment um, about how credit unions um, can take part in this. So, yes, I think that's certainly something worth pursuing in relation to linkages between local authorities and credit unions uh, because I would be interested in how loans are paid back and... Uh, Know, what the power that local authorities have for that and how that can work alongside credit unions. You're on yeah. in our agenda, Linda, but I think the point's been made and I think it's something we need to look at in terms of the bill. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Uh, thank you, and I, I agree with uh, Linda about the credit unions point. Um, Paul, oh, I certainly wouldn't be against a, a loan scheme. Uh, there have been difficulties before where councils have operated loan schemes in other spheres. Um, and I think if we're going to explore that, we have to take cognizance of some of those pitfalls that have been experienced in the past. So if, if we could get that information too, I think that would be useful, Convener. I can provide any evidence that they have or, or even just their own perspectives on that. That would certainly inform us as we, as we scrutinise the bill as we go forward. I think it's something we could contact COSLA to, to try and explore further. It would be, be useful to get a, a, a clearer picture on that. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to add uh, to the discussion this morning? Any final comments that, that you want to make or anything you want to leave us with in terms of your views on this, Helen? When we're talking about the, the loan scheme as well, I think some of our customers do get confused about the, the budgeting loans through the DWP uh, and the crisis grants through ourselves. Now, if you were going to consider a loan scheme, I think that may confuse people quite a bit as well, but it was just to take that into consideration. The only other concerns that we have as an authority was the people who... We don't have anything within the, the bill, as far as I'm aware, about the fraudulent aspects of people uh, misusing the budget, and I was wondering if there, there would be something in to account for that. I know the DWP have a fraud section within and we're going on to the, the one tier uh, approach for fraud. Should that be something that we should be considering welfare reform? It doesn't appear to be on it at the moment. Okay. Uh, Dave. Uh, yeah, just to kind of one last thing to, to add. Um, Council McDonald had, had kind of started to, to raise the issue about the administration uh, grant and um, 
but we, within Dundee, we, we have been quite frustrated about the, the, the kind of level of grant compared to the investment in the holistic approach. Um, however, even stripping out the, what you might call the kind of added um, elements, um, to even the purely process the applications, we're, we feel we're still um, short by around about 30 to 40 per cent in terms of the, the actual administration grant funding. So that's something of, a, of concern going forward for, for Dundee. The financial memoranda that go with, with the legislation to see whether it's adequate. So if that's a point you want us to, to address, then certainly we'll take that on board. Again, anyway. in, in some of the submissions, but again, um, you know, absent any sort of analysis of what, how the, 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 the claim is being um, put forward, uh, it's, it's just one statement. Uh, if there is evidence as to a shortfall, it would be useful to have the committee An invitation out to you. It. If you have evidence on the, the administration costs and, and the, the money that's made available to you, that would be, that would be beneficial to us as we look at this, Helen. Uh, we're doing a benchmarking exercise, and that's one of the areas that we're looking at, uh, how people were using their budget, how it was getting shored up, whether maybe other departments within the council, and they were certainly recently had sent out a survey all local authorities and they're uh, actually meeting at the moment to look at uh, the, the findings. So you might get some useful information yeah, from Yeah, that's an Osla. area we need to pursue. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much uh, to everyone for your contributions this morning. That certainly started the ball rolling for us uh, in terms of looking at this bill and we'll give it the maximum amount of scrutiny and consideration. Obviously, if there's anything that occurs to you after this morning that you want to inform us of that we might not have covered so far or anything you want to add to uh, in terms of the, the points that, that were made, feel free to contact the clerks and, and we'll take on board any views that you have. But thanks very much uh, for your contributions this morning, which have been very helpful. Um, and I'll suspend the, the meeting for a couple of minutes uh, to allow us to uh, allow the witnesses to depart. And we move into private, and we move into private session. Okay, thanks. <laughs>